I'd like to call this gathering together and welcome all of you on behalf of the Whitney Historical Society. And it's wonderful to see all of you here to hear this famous speaker that we have <laughs> tuned in for tonight. You may say that afterwards. <laughs> we'll give you we'll give you your evaluation sheet as you leave. Okay. Facebook okay. likes. <laughs> Um, I just have a, a couple of announcements, and one of them is that we need to have members of the society, and I think we have our, ooh, do we have a quorum? No, I don't think so. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I think we do. Uh, we need to have anyone, let me say, the nominating committee proposed um, Bill and Jane, am I right? Was well, you're Bill and Jane? Yes. yes, Bill and Jane as uh, re-electing as an, an uh, curator and the treasurer. And if there is any other nomination from the floor, it's time to Somebody, speak. please. There must be an accountant. <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't want to give him up because he just put in hours and hours and hours yeah, with the federal or the state tax. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> Both of them. So anyway, we want to keep it. Are there any objections to those? All those in favor say aye. 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 And <laughs> Bill and Jane are in for another three years. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. That item had to be taken care of by, by the bylaws. So we are happy to have Jim here tonight, and he's going to tell us about his wonderful experiences as our animal control officer. And I'm sure he will answer your questions, and we'll go home filled with knowledge. So, if the floor is yours, Jim, okay. someone is just arriving. The famous John. Uh, <laughs> just, um, I heard it was free food. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh is right. He's now he's cornered. Okay, it's all yours, Jim. Oh, no, one, one more thing. You just heard me say, Bill, uh, some people have said they wanted to pay their dues. So, while we're having refreshments, he might be over in that corner and you can... Give him your dues if you'd like after to join. After he gets refreshed, right? You should put him by the refreshment. Right. All right. Yeah. After Bill, you can come over here and collect the dues and get food at the same time. So anyway, the, the dues are ten dollars, and we would welcome anyone who wants to join to become a part of us. But a lot of the annual people weren't able to be at the last meeting, and they were ten dollars plus to any donation. Right. Oh, Judy's my membership pusher. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Judy. Okay, I'll keep quiet and let this show begin. A year ago, last April, Whitey Grange and the Whitey Agriculture Committee decided to have uh, Agriculture Day in Whitey. They wanted to kind of honor the Whitey farms and uh, kind of to see, let the people in town know about more about the Whitey farms. So the Agriculture Day, uh, Went off very good. We uh, uh, part of the Agriculture Day. Uh, I won't get into that part of it, but uh, part of Agriculture Day, we want to make a film and to kind of show what the Whitney Farms were, because the Whitney Farms today are nothing like they were 60, 70 years ago at all. Entirely different. And 50 years from now, and what years are going to be? Uh, <coughs> 19, uh, 2000, <laughs> see now, 2071, it's going to be the 300th anniversary. And then uh, we got a film here now, which FCAT did, FCAT put it together, and um, we're very appreciative of them for doing it. And I went to see Chris, uh, who's head of FCAT, and that we'd like to make a film about where he farmed. Great, sounds good, I'll do everything I can, I'll do all the processing for you and setting up for you and said, well, how do we go about it? He said, well, he says Frontier Regional School has a uh, class about uh, television and uh, they work co very cooperatively with the um, FCAT and he said, uh, Kevin Murphy's a teacher. Go see Kevin and talk to Kevin. I went and talked to Kevin. He said, well, sounds great. He says, I'll have three of my kids. They'll do the filming. Three of my students. I'm say kids, three of my students, and they'll do the filming. And uh, so we set it up. So uh, there were 16 farms said they'd like to be filmed. So I would go ahead and meet with three or four of the farms and set up a day, because he could go about 3 o'clock at 3.30 when class got out, and I would meet 
uh, Kevin and three of his students at Frontier, that we head to some of the farms they set up. So I had the farm set up, more or less about what we're going to show and do, and then he would come and he would uh, introduce himself and the kids, and the kids would do the filming. They did a fantastic job. We had 16 uh, farms in town. How many have seen the film? I see quite a few of you had. Those of you who haven't, uh, it is on YouTube. You look up YouTube and look up Whitney Farmers, look up YouTube, look up uh, FCAT, then look up Whitney Farmers, and it's an hour and a half film. You don't have to watch it all at once, but um, also Chris gave me a copy of the film, Farmers of Whitley, and he said to present it to the Historic Society so that uh, 50 years or 53 years from now, in 2071, they can show this film and show what it was like 50 years ago, which would be very interesting for them. Adelia, this is the film for the historical society. <laughs> FCAT is great. Uh, they show all the local committees and all local stuff and do a lot of documentaries. He said this is one of the best documentaries he did, so it was pretty good. Nice yeah. And uh, also, um, when I turn on my television, first thing I go on, I turn 23 to see if FCAT's on, is anything locally on. And you find the select men's meeting, the school committee meetings, you find all the problems that the different towns have. Like this is Conway, they got a big problem, they got two kids who are going to uh, charter school in the Chinese charter school. It's costing $21,000 a year apiece to have them go. $42,000 was all of a sudden added on to their school budget. And uh, all the towns are paying a lot of money now to have the kids go to uh, the charter schools. The school choice works out a lot better. The uh, school choice is just like it's $5,000, I think, that the town pays to the other, the other school pays the town. If we have somebody go to another school, they pay the town away the uh, $5,000. Well, luckily, we have about four or five kids go to other schools, and we have 40 to 50 school kids come into our school. So we get a lot of money out of them, and where our school had dwindled down so low with the kids, we didn't have full classes. This fill up our classes and made it very, very good for everybody like that. So uh, when we did the films, uh, we also, one time, one of the children had a, a father had a drone. So some of the farms in East Whitley and uh, Quan Quan Farm, we had a drone fly over, so the drone is in that films of uh, different places. So, the, um, I graduated from Stockbridge School at UMass uh, in 1947, and I took dairy manufacturing. <coughs> My father had been in the ice cream business back in the uh, 1920s. He started making ice cream at the general store in North Hadley around 1900, moved to Northampton, uh, if you know where Jack August Market was, he had his ice cream place right behind Jack August Market. And uh, he sold the hoods in 1929. My brother started out in 1938 with a little store on Bridge Street, Northampton, selling a little cabin and sold ice cream and candy. And he would drive a bus full time. His wife was a nurse full time. And so uh, two of between them started up and he ended up with a wholesale ice cream business. They had three ice cream trucks that delivered ice cream uh, all to stores and soda farms all over the three counties here. And uh, it worked out great for him. He kept getting bigger and bigger. <coughs> he was buying his ice cream mix from Crowley's on Beanton, New York, and uh, by a trailer truck, and Friendly started at the same time. And the two of them were buying their mix from Friendly. They come, huge trailer truck would bring in with ice cream mix for them. And then uh, they had a lot of smaller customers, and so my brother and friendlies would get together, and if they were going to raise the rate, if one of them would quit, then when uh, both quit, they wouldn't have to be able to come in and sell the smaller stuff. So I learned how at Stockbridge to uh, uh, make ice cream, and uh, from the very beginning, and when I learned how to. Uh, make ice cream, my brother would get the ice cream mix with a flavored color in it and just freeze it. Well, I went to Stockbridge to learn how to figure right from the very beginning. So my brother built that brick plant across from the fairgrounds in Hampton, right on Bridge Street. It still sells a sell ice cream company mm -hmm. over the top of it. So then 
we buy the milk, the cream, the butter, the egg, everything from the local farmers and make ice cream. So uh, I was doing that, and then uh, in 1949, Ann and I got married. We had 68 years of blessed marriage. Right now, though, she's in a nursing home, but uh, we're been married for 68 years. At that time, I came home to work with my father. He was older and had a cut down on the uh, flower business. He had built the first greenhouse in 1934 down there. And, uh, but at that time, he got older and had to have help. So I came home with my wife. My wife did the uh, floral designing, and she went to Boston for a week to uh, school. And when she went down to school, uh, I was small. Let's see now. She went down to school. Uh, How's your mother? Well, my mother. My mother went down to school. That's right. <laughs> uh, one generation off. <laughs> and never went to design school. She learned it right there. But my mother, my, my mother went to design school. I had, I was young and went to school, so I stayed up to Uncle Hard on Esther's, Judy's uh, mother and father. I, I stayed there. Grandma. And me. <laughs> and you. <laughs> yeah. So that was a uh, really good stay in there. So, uh, oh, where was I? I grabbed to OK. I had been to dairy manufacturing and we had a lot of uh, work in dairy cows and stuff like that at uh, Stockbridge. So when uh, an opening came up for a, uh, a uh, animal inspector in town, I said, gee, I'm qualified maybe because of my dairy training I had. So I applied for the job and it was $100 a year, which was great with three little kids and uh, really helped out a lot. And so, um, this is the book here, of the annual report in 1958. Way back in 58, I was doing animal inspecting. I'm going to read you one of the reports here. It won't take more than 25 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> report of the inspector of animals. The annual inspection of animals of barns was made and showed the following results. 59 barns housed 675 head of cattle, 26 horses, 176 sheep, and 36 women. <coughs> Conditions of animals and barns were satisfactory with one exception, which was immediately taken care of. That one was happened to be Kwong uh, Kwong Farm, was a beautiful farm. They had uh, the greatest uh, ice cream, it was uh, milk and ice cream too. And they sold out of Holyoke, all places like that, it was certified milk. It wasn't pasteurized, it was certified milk. And then the depression came in 1929 and 30, and they went out of business. I remember when I was about 10 years old going to the auction at Corn Club Farm, which is sad to see poor Mr. Wells walking around so sad, all his cows being auctioned off, all the equipment being auctioned off. It was 1944 it was auctioned off. 44. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was 16 then. Mm -hmm. And then so um, the big auction there, and then um, so then the, the state uh, emptied for a long time, and then all of a sudden somebody rented it for a while. And they had cows there, they had Holstein cows there. So I had to go inspect that barn. When I went in there, I couldn't believe it. They went in there and the stench was terrible. All the cows had diarrhea and all they were feeding them with no hay at all, just grain. And the water cups that they had, they went around with a pail of water and put water in the cups. Now when cows drink water, when our cows down there, we had a tub that big around, mm -hmm. and a cow would drink a half a tub full of water. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, they were drinking from a little water cup. They had no hay, which is why they had diarrhea. So I told them in three days that they didn't have a load of hay in there, and had the water hooked up to the water cups, I was going to close them up. So I went back in three or four days, and they had the hay there, and they were working on the water cups. And they stayed there for about three or four or five months and went out of business, which was a blessing when they went out of business. There were three nice dairy farms in uh, Whitey then. The uh, Belders, who were the Belders' uh, parents? Dean's. Dean's. Dean. 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 That was Dean Farm back then. The Belders now, that's their uh, in, uh, generation now. And uh, the uh, Scott Farm and the uh, my cousin, um, Alan uh, Damon in West Waverly. Those are the only three dairy farms. All the rest of the farms, all single farms. 
all the way up the State Road in Waitley, all over Christian Lane, all up and down the Straits Road, or Long Plain Road now, and the River Road. Every place small for the farm, small farm. They had the horses to plow with and work with. They had, uh, some of them were just getting tractors in. They had their cows, they had their pigs, they had their chickens and dogs and cats. And they had a, a really nice home life. They had the butter and their milk and all the things like that. And the uh, woman would do all the canning and stuff like that. They didn't have freezing back then. They did all the canning, put things away. It was a coal cellar. Everybody's cellar was damp cellar. So they take the potatoes and the beets and the parsnips and the uh, vegetables like that and put them down the cellar for the whole winter. And then, of course, during the winter, they uh, could hunt and fish, stuff like that, for game. And back then, uh, the times were when uh, somebody killed a cow or a pig or something like that, they uh, would share it with the neighbors. You couldn't, everybody couldn't eat the whole cow, the cow and didn't have a place to store it. So you share it with neighbors and relatives like that. So the next time somebody else killed one, they'd share it back like that. Back then, it was a lot of sharing, even with the work. Remember the work, hanging tobacco. Uh, my Zolis, our next door neighbors, when they got up to the peak of the tobacco to hang in the barn, they'd always call me up, come down tomorrow morning, go hang the peak. So I'd go down and be the one between the third tier and a peak for them, like that. And Tananas is the same way, or shared work with Tananas. Later on with uh, Pop Tananas, uh, he was always a great guy, next door neighbor. He would uh, we'd build them all the hay. Every farm had to have <coughs> hay, because he had to feed the horses and the cows, and every, everybody had it. Uh, mowing of hay, and uh, so we're going to mow the hay, but we had a tractor then. Because uh, back then, to get the tractor during World War II, you had to um, uh, have so many acres. So between my father and Uncle Howard, Judy's father, they had enough to get one tractor. So during 1944, or like that, they got a tractor, and then after the war, they sold the tractor, each one bought a tractor. So, but they shared things like that. So popped the, I drive the tractor, popped and asked me on the back with a mower, that, one of those old mowers, you know, I put the mower up and down like that. We'd mow his hay, and then we'd go on and mow our hay. Then came time to uh, get the manure gone. Well, he'd come down and with his manure spreader and my loader, we'd load the manure like that, and then off we'd go uh, uh, run my manure. Then we'd go back and do his manure. People traded like that back and forth. Farmers had to do that. They didn't have so many equipment. They, Am I talking too fast? Go up for air or something. <laughs> okay. Well, the uh, typical farm uh, back then had a uh, maybe anywhere from three to eight or nine people living in a house. <clears throat> grandpa and grandma lived in the house. They both of them were alive. And the father and mother did and anywhere from three to five or six kids. You can tell that by my buddy Ed Farrick over there, his house there. He had a, a Farrick's corner over there, the White House across from his nice brick house he built. Uh, they had uh, what, four boys and a girl there, and the parents, uh, so I made what, seven in the house, <laughs> roughly. Anyway, uh, right now, it's all different, entirely different, <clears throat> because now, in our generation, all our friends, a lot of them have passed away, a lot of them are living alone, so right now, Ed lives alone in a beautiful house he built, a beautiful family he raised. Next door neighbor, neighbor Frank Gromowski lived there by himself. Next to him, John Gromowski lived there before he passed away. Next door to that was Eleanor Farrick. She lived alone. Across the street was Stanley Gromowski. Five houses there, one person each house, where the other smaller house had seven in a house. And that's all the houses where the farms were. All like that. And, uh, Really, so many different now, and they all worked in the farm. The kids all worked in the farms and uh, stuff like that. So anyway, I'll finish my report. <laughs> Two more sentences. Blood testing of herds was continued, with only one recent reactor showing up. Three dogs were quarantined during the year and later released. The dogs were a tough time because when you had a dog bite, then you had to quarantine the dog, and you went to quarantine the dog. The people always got mad at you. <laughs> because uh, they were all your friends back then, and you'd have to keep the dog tied up for two weeks, and the uh, or, or hidden, uh, 
and they're tied up somewhere or in the house somewhere. And then two weeks later, I'd have to go back, and if they were all right, everything's okay. They are all afraid of rabies. That's the way they test to make sure that nobody got rabies back then. So, um, <coughs> okay, each farm, they had uh, the crops back then were either tobacco or cucumbers or potatoes, almost all tobacco. Almost every one of those farms was anywhere from five to 15 acres of tobacco. And there was one big tobacco farm, it was a Swift farm, and they had the big uh, shade tobacco farm right on the corner across from Castaways, and they had the um, big mountain farm up there. Otherwise, every farm had to have a cash crop. And because uh, you got your food and stuff like that, and your place to live, you had your wood for your fire, stuff like that. But what you had to have, you had to buy sugar, you had to buy groceries like that, you had to pay your uh, other kinds of bills and gasoline. So everybody had a cash crop. And that worked out great until the big uh, 1950. In 1950, uh, the tobacco was <coughs> booming here. Everybody had tobacco. And so, by 1950, they started homogenizing tobacco the year before that. They were homogenizing tobacco. They would take all the junk tobacco, mix it up in a thing, put the chemicals in it, make it out and roll out the tobacco leaves like that. And all of a sudden, there was no demand for your leaf tobacco. From being everybody raising it, everybody wanted it, good price for it. Uh, we were getting 50 cents a pound for it before. And all of a sudden, within two years, there was no bargain, for, no uh, place to uh, sell it. So all the farms, every one of the farms, the men had to go to work. No more farming for them. They had to go to work. So they got jobs at Tap and Die in Northampton, the Springfield, jobs all around. <coughs> so they uh, still did a little bit of farming, grew potatoes, did the hay still, stuff like that. Still kept their cows and. Uh, but had no cash crop, so they all had to go to work. We changed uh, priming entirely. Uh, there were two, just two um, farms that sold vegetables. The Shuck Farm, which is where the, uh, the uh, annual uh, perennial farm is down there now. There was a Shuck family, S-I-O-K family, and a Krabetsky family. There were only two roadside stands then around. And where now there's all roadside stands all over the place and people selling and there's some vegetables growing all over. Um, and every farm had uh, at least two acres of field corn, one or two acres of field corn. You had to have the corn for your horses and your cows and your chickens and stuff like that. And right now when they grow corn, you have a big tractor and a big thing back and rolling five rolls at a time they plant. When you harvest it, goes through, zoom by, chops it all up, and the corn goes out, and you have all the corn comes out, five rows at a time. Back when we did it, after we got a plow and harrowed, we had a tape to grow corn. We had a little uh, marker with three, three little, uh, little, uh, harrow, little uh, thing to diggers on it there, and uh, uh, 30 inches apart. And We'd have the horse, we'd lead the horse. When I was a kid, they would have a kid lead the horse. And then uh, I'd hold the uh, thing, the marker there, my three rolls at a time up and down. Then on the way back, you only my two rolls, because you had to keep one roll for your mark. And then the, horse, the boy would lead you, would lead just the right place and have it marked. Then you always marked the crossways. So you had it one way and the other way, so it had your little things of corn, right? The little spots. So then you had your bag over here with the corn. You always had some kind of uh, tar on or something like that so the crows wouldn't eat it. Because with a mark like that, the crows knew where every hill was. They dig it all up. So you walk along the hole and pull back the, the place where the cross was, drop your two or five years of uh, kernels of corn in, put the thing back up and step on it, walk along. That's the way you planted your corn. And uh, these days, you don't see any teepees of corn. When we cut our corn, you had to dry it. So uh, instead of going through with a big machine, you had to dry it. So we would take and take two of the hills of 
green corn that was uh, with the ears all on it, ready to the end of end of August. Tie it together like that, and take your cut your corn and stack it up against it. You'd have a great big round thing like that with all dry corn. Do your time. You remember those, yeah? And uh, then you had it in the 30th of uh, uh, end of um, so September. You'd be dry then. You go out in the field and sit down in the field, and you had a husking thing like that, a thing like grab it like that, with a thing on the end, you could husk the corn that way out in the field. And beans were smart. They grew quite a lot of corn. So they used to have a husking bee. How many ever went to a husking bee? There's one. <laughs> yeah, another one over there. You have Grace Lynch, what's with you, girl? You were the husking bees. Yeah. Yeah. Well, husking bees were, when they planted the corn, you know, I was planting a few red kernels of corn that had red ears. So you had beans, had huge stacks of corn in the barn, and bags of corn to give to everybody, you know, the husk, to get the corn husk. If you came across a red ear, then you could open the red ear, go kiss any girl you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> or any girl kiss any guy she wanted. That was risque back in those days. <laughs> Be. And uh, of course, the guys would all say back four or five red ear, uh, red kernels of corn ourselves and plant with our corn next year. <laughs> we got a head start. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and every farm, farm, of course, had a corn crib. They had to have an ice house and a corn crib. When you got your corn all uh, husked, you put in a corn crib to keep the squirrels away from it to have it for the winter. And during the winter, when you wanted to have grain for your, you one kind of grain for your cows, one kind of grain for your turkeys, one kind of grain for your uh, chickens, you know, like that. And you take your corn and bags, bring it down to Riley's Grain Mill on Mill River, down in Hatfield. The grain mill, the grain mill is still down there, not operating as a grain mill, but it's a, uh, you bring down your bags of grain, of corn, and tell them what you want, how many bags of this, how many bags of that you wanted, and they would make up the grain for you, for your, Cows your animals, which uh, that always worked out pretty good. The, um, <coughs> then, um, oh, the horses, it's a dirty story. <laughs> the ho horses ate the uh, whole ears of corn. They crunched it off, it was hard, you know. They'd eat it, but they could not chew it, so they'd eat them whole. So when they got through, uh, you take the shovel, shovel it out to the pig pen, you know. So the pigs spend love getting them whole kernels of corn out there. They'd root through all the kernels of corn, gobble up the kernel, then we'd eat the pigs. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound too good, but... Uh... Recycling. <laughs> okay. And then um, that corn crib was always good because um, we used to have a lot of squirrels around. And the big delicacy where John, when he was growing up, was squirrel pie. So instead of chicken pie, we had squirrel pie. And squirrels always had real legs, were always had a big hunk of nice meat in there, real legs, because they're springing them. And you get six or seven or eight squirrels and skin them for the skins, and then have those big, nice meaty legs like that, and put them all in a bucket with a car on, with a uh, biscuit on top, you know. It was delicious. You know? We had a sister down in Springfield. Uh, when she was between husbands one time, she used to come up every Sunday to eat. So uh, she went every Sunday over the front door, what's for dinner today? I'd say, oh, go be your partner, whatever it is, you know. She opened the door, she said, what's for dinner today? I said, squirrel pie, she slammed the door shut. I went on glasses, she said, and off she went. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't gonna have any squirrel pie. <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> so, um, Tough time farmers had was getting animals bred. Uh, back then, you know, all those individual farms, the uh, bigger farms like uh, the uh, Deeds and the Scots, and uh, they have their own bulls, you know. But uh, small farms you couldn't afford to have a bill on uh, bull. But every once in a while, one of the little bigger small farms would raise one cat instead of usually they took. Uh, and fixed them so that they were a steer instead of a bull and raised them for meat. <laughs> Every once in a while, they'd raise one for a, a bull. And then uh, you'd see the farmers going up with a 
a cow or the, on a rope heading up for the bull, you know, to get bread. The uh, only thing with a cow, whenever they were in heat, they all jumped on another cow, so that's when you could tell where they were in heat. Another story uh, about Patanatis, um, he wanted to get his uh, cow bread, and he didn't want to go pay the guy for the, uh, for the bull. So he had about a year and a half steer. And the steer was jumping on a cow a little bit, so he knew he was anxious. Well, he had a cow that was in heat. So he tried to get the bull, but the bull wasn't big enough. So I was there watching him. He backed the cow up, so the cow's legs were in the gutter, so we're short. <laughs> <laughs> so he got up. And the bull was really trying good. So Pops and Ants got on one side, his brother John, his cousin John got on the other side. He lifts him up a little bit, the minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that on YouTube too? <laughs> well, I hope this ain't going to be on. <laughs> yeah, Chris goes through and cuts out the bad parts. <laughs> so, and also, Papaszewski next door, he was always kind of, you know, cash conscious, you know. So, when the, uh, they had the um, uh, animal. Uh, uh, Sale, you know, when he's waiting. Uh, what do they call it? Auction. Animal auction over in Swayde. When he wanted to get his pig's bread, he'd go over the auction and buy a pig. Bring it back, put the pig pen for a week with his pigs. Next week, he'd take the pig back, sell it. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta hear that. But that's what he had with our pig. We had a pig box. It was one about that long, and handles taking on both sides, and you could carry it easy. We get a pig in a pig box, and we head down to uh, Florence, down to uh, North Maple Street, not Mayor North Maple, um, in Florence, he had a brush shop there. That's Spray a big bean farm over there. We bring our pig over there and leave her for a week and go back and get it and be bred. We got a lot of little pigs coming out. <laughs> That's what we used to breed our uh, pigs like that. So, <clears throat> we had, uh, my grandmother gave me an Asher cow, an Asher calf one time. And uh, we had to get it breed to an ash year. The only <coughs> ash year cows that we were around, the bully could get was Jones's own Amherst. So we had to get a uh, carrier and uh, bring our cow over to Jones's own Amherst to get our ash year bred. But Pompton has a lot of fun, all the jokes. Put to my father all the time, Jim, you got story, you got story. My father told me a joke and he loved it. And Pompton had liked to pull jokes, I liked to pull jokes on him. <laughs> One time we had a bull calf. I said to Neil Sanders, what's a bull calf worth? He's only $5 at auction money. He's got $5 no <coughs> for them. I tried around, all I get is $5. Pop the ass come down, you got a bull calf? I said, yeah. Want to sell it? He said, yeah. How much you want for it? I said, $10. $10, it's only worth $5, it's only worth $5. I finally sold it for $8. <laughs> then he come down with a bag, his pickup truck, put the calf in the bag, Gave me eight dollars. I hand my father five dollars. I get three. How come you get three dollars? Oh, I got bull calf. Only worth five dollars. My father get five. I get three. <laughs> <laughs> Another time, Pop and Anna came down. She said, "I bought a hundred day old chicks." He says, "They told me they're white rock pullets, which are good. White, uh, not white rocks are the bad ones. Uh, they're they're roosters. <laughs> white leg iron. No, no, white ones are the bad ones." <laughs> anyway, there are a the lot of layers. time he says they're what? <laughs> the white leggerns are good layers. Yeah. But they're not good eating. Okay, but if some of them are good eating, some of them are good layers. He said sometimes you get, you know, but these are all supposed to be the, the good layers, he said. So I got a hundred of them, he said, I pay two cents a piece for them, he says. I sold Ashland fifty of them, I keep twenty-five, I'll sell you twenty-five. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll buy twenty-five. And uh, I took 25, and it turned out to be the bad ones. So, was the bad ones. <laughs> so I talked to somebody, I got the pills. You put a pill under their neck, and in six weeks they turn into a chicken. Like to a hen. They'll turn into a hen, like, you know? So later on, uh, I used 25 pills, and 18 of them turned into, like, they look like they're pullets, you know? Pop the ants come down. You got pullets? I said, yeah, how come? He said, Ashley, got 50, they're all roosters. I got 25, they're all roosters. You got 25, you got most of them bullets. 
He said, I made my just lucky, I said, you know. <laughs> tell, you, tell you what he says. I'll give you 15 of mine and you give me 10 of yours. Yeah, I says, okay, I met the deal. You got a truck down, got his bag, put him back, you know. One more than a week. All of a sudden, he's got crawling out in his barn. <laughs> they turned they turn back into uh, one of the, uh, the uh, guys comes to turn back into roosters. <laughs> um, we love jokes like that back and forth on each other all the time. But um, after a tough time getting, uh, real tough time getting our cows and animals uh, bred, we uh, had a blessing come. Bill Fitzgerald from South Asheville came. He was an artificial inseminator. So instead of worrying about how you're going to get your cows bred, you, if your cow got a heat, you know, you saw them jump on one another. The cow got a heat, you call a Bill Fitzgerald. Next morning he come down, big bag, choice of about five different bulls you could have, you know. Then he would uh, inseminate the cows, you know, for uh, like $10 to $15 price or something like that. I won't go into the process of telling you about the insemination of the cows. I'll just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's it. I'm sure you've got questions. Jim's going to answer. John, tell them the story of uh, when they had to leave the cabbages out in the field to rot um, back. Um, it was either during the war or after the war where there was no market for cabbage and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know about that one? Well, the historic, I did because I saw it in the newspaper. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, I thought you knew no. that story. Okay, never mind then. But I knew about the... Uh, you tell it. Yeah, I, I don't know it. the details. Well, why don't you tell it? Well, I don't know the real details, but at one <clears throat> point, there was no market for uh, cabbage and that kind of stuff, whether uh, whoever was supposed to buy it didn't buy it. And so the farmers had to leave it out in the field. They left it out in the field to rot because it, it would cost too much to harvest it. Well, I, uh, supposedly a representative from the you know, state rep or somebody had come by for a visit and they brought him out to the field where all of the cabbage was rotten because the price was so low and had to introduce the, uh, the state rep to the farming, that, that part of agriculture which he may not have seen from, from the city, you know. I know Ann and I wanted to make some money with our, uh, Bill was uh, about two years old, we had him on the crib out there, we raised an acre of cucumbers. That was a job, <laughs> picking cucumbers. And uh, they had to be only a certain size, it can't be uh, small and this, it can't be bigger than that. And the bigger ones, you ought to throw them in a pile uh, out in where it's school, you know. And all of a sudden, we got a call one day, they're taking, making relish of the pickle shop in South Deerfield. So they can use all the big cucumbers you can get. So we got the truck, we loaded them on the truck with all the bags of big cucumbers, brought them up. And, Got rid of all the big cucumbers and they could relish up there in the south. <laughs> a lot of experiences in this very young kid. Didn't you uh, handle the gate for tobacco? Oh, with Uncle Howard, a little tobacco. Uncle Howard, Jody's father, my uncle, was a very meticulous farmer. Oh, everything in his farm was 100% perfect. He grew uh, about, about 12, 15 acres of tobacco. He grew two little onion patches he had up in the pasture. And uh, everything had to be done just exactly right with him. He, he was perfect. Every tool was right in his place, you know. Every one or tool was right there. We have a policy down in the south of Flores. If you're looking for a tool, try to remember where you used it last, then try to find it. <laughs> 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 When Uncle Howard was uh, raising tobacco up on the pasture, pasture lot, that's where the water department is up. Uh, there's a house there now on that lot, and a water tank up behind it. And um, he hired me to watch a gate so the cows wouldn't get out. And um, I could watch a gate, and he was always uh, very meticulous with it. When he was tying tobacco, he would know everything that came in there. Got a little bit too green, a little bit too muddy. He hollered a Simon. Up there, Simon was cutting the tobacco. He yelled at Simon, send word back by the driver to Simon, he's cutting a little bit too much. You know, stuff like that. Uncle Howard, a very understand, a great, great, great farmer. Tell the story about the horse. <coughs> he was moderated at church for long and moderated at town for a long time, and he was, uh, uh, what are you doing at the church? Moderator. 
Moderate. He, he moderated moderate. the church too for years and years. Oh, and years. Years. treasure. There's there's a there's story about, treasure. about that. You know, when I don't think it was that field. It was probably the one down behind the library or something. But one of his, he, he was harvesting tobacco in one place, and the horses were bringing up to the barn in another place. It was woods, wood, not to the store. Will you tell it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I got this from my brother-in-law. I wasn't there, of course, but the legend in the family is that after the great hurricane of 38, everybody had a lot of fallen timber. They wanted to cut it up, get it out to market as, as they could, as soon as they could. <clears throat> well, Howard had a lot up in the fields up beyond the fields, up in the woods, up behind the house, and he decided to participate in this also. <clears throat> and he, they'd cut the trees down and, and hi, hi, take the horses, tie them to the horses, and the horses would pull them down the hill and over across lots to the, some sort of a station on the street where the trucks would pick them up. Well, somewhere along the line, the horses figured out that they got the horses were by themselves. Well, the horses were so well trained or accustomed to the work, they'd do it without being guided. So they just hitch them up to the logs and send them on, on their way, and they'd show up at the street where someone would disconnect the logs and stack them and send the horses back. Well, somewhere along the line, the horses figured out there was one place along the route where they couldn't be seen from either end. <laughs> they'd stop and have a nap. Uncle <laughs> <laughs> Howard donated that land to the library. Is that right? The library. No. That was the field down behind here that uh, he had. Well, that's very interesting what you tell about Howard. I, I have to point out that those traits did not descend in the family. <laughs> when, I, when we've been married one year, oh. when the tobacco, we the give them, uh, sugar of tobacco. Yes. <laughs> Uncle Howard used to buy tobacco. <clears throat> and that was also a job for all the farmers around. During the wintertime, you worked in a tobacco shop, sorting the tobacco. And Uncle Howard had a tobacco shop over there. Well, Uncle Howard came down to buy my father's tobacco, and he said, well, he said, I can't give you a top price. He says, you had one little spot that was, uh, that was uh, a little shorter, he said, so I can't give you a top price for your tobacco. My father got mad, and then about a month later, we hadn't sold the tobacco. I said, I'm going to go to Uncle Howard. I went to Uncle Howard. I said, you know, you couldn't give us you know, a top price for our tobacco. How much could you give? I couldn't give you 50 cents a pound, I give you 48 cents a pound, he said. <laughs> and that's how, he was buying with somebody else, not for himself, too. He's buying with somebody. That's how meticulous Uncle Howard was. He was, he was an old-time Yankee. On top of old-time Yankees, Uncle Howard goes back to Captain Benjamin Waite, right? Captain Benjamin Waite, well, you historical people know about that. Uh, he was the head of the militia in Hatfield. And when Deerfield got attacked, he took the Hatfield militia to go up and help uh, old Deerfield, when the Indians attacked him, he got as far as Bloody Brook, the am Indians ambushed him there. And he was wounded in that battle, and he died later. And that's uh, Judy's great, 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 great grandfather. Andrew. 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 And, and Andrew. also, yeah, your sister. <laughs> and um, also, I kind of claim him too, because my aunt married Uncle Howard, <laughs> Uncle Howard you know, so I. I claim Benjamin Wade too. <laughs> Is we got one on our side of the family too, though. Got Warner's on your side. We got Captain Jonathan Warner. Captain Jonathan Warner uh, lived in Haydenville in Northampton, Northampton then. And uh, at the time of the Revolution, he got a letter from either, they said it's either uh, Patrick Henry or George Washington, got a letter to raise a troop in uh, Hampshire County and meet him at Ticonderoga. So he raised a troop of uh, men in. Uh, Hatcher County went to Ticonderoga. They fought in the battle of Ticonderoga. They fought in the battle two or three others afterward. He got wounded, got wounded, he did. And uh, when he got back, they gave him two huge grants of land up on Mountain Street, uh, Haydenville Road. You know where the uh, small reservoirs up on Haydenville Road? That was uh, area right through there. Mountain Street where Adams Road 
was the two big tracts of land that were given to my great great grandfather and their great great grandfather. And um, he um, uh, got the big, two big tracts of land there. And one was from my grandfather, uh, Charles Warner, and uh, his brother, Will Warner. Each had one of the tracts of land passed down. And so we got a lot of history in our town and our people in town. That's still in the same family. And so, oh yeah, at the time of the Bicentennial, 200 years after the revolution, they got an award that was a, uh, a Bicentennial farm in the same family for 200 years farming the same family. My cousin John Water still lives in the farm. So it's been all the generations. A lot of history. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, then we have a...